Well, thank you folks for coming. You know, for the past year and a half, we've been doing our talks all through Zoom. And it's really nice to be able to uh, see some live faces again. Neil, said, you got my message today. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Uh, the plan was, you know, eventually to go back in the tavern, but obviously the tavern being so small, no windows, we felt it would be much better for all parties, including us, to be outside for a little while. So, uh, but it's nice to see you all here. I'm John Devenel, the president of the board, and uh, I've been a volunteer here for, I don't know, almost 20 years now, I believe. <laughs> Doesn't seem possible. And Rob has uh, been here doing, he's on our board, by the way, and uh, you've done about, what, four talks? Four talks. This is your fourth talk yep. here. So, so you folks know that the uh, topic is sketching Burgoyne's campaign, and Rob's going to be showing us some of these watercolors that were done by uh, this Hessian captain, I would assume, perhaps when Burgoyne came down the lake in 1777. Uh, so we're, before I turn it over to uh, Rob, I'd just like to mention that Rob is an award-winning author of a dozen books on American military history. He earned his master's in American history from Rhode Island College. He's a former National Park Ranger and for the last several years is uh, working for the Immigration Service. He resides in Jericho Center with his wife and two kids. So uh, join me in greeting Rob. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great to be here. Um, ironically, I was the very last uh, in-person speaker last February before uh, all this mess uh, came. I see some faces. I talked about uh, uh, military weapons uh, here in the Champlain Valley during the Revolution and the uh, Civil War. So it's certainly uh, great to be back. Uh, before I begin, just a, a brief caveat. I do not speak German. Um, I speak uh, pretty good English and uh, probably can get by up in Canada. But um, if anybody out there speaks uh, German, if I mispronounce something, um, I do apologize. Uh, please uh, do bear with me. But uh, the topic today is a pretty famous uh, series of paintings uh, done by a Hessian captain during the American Revolution. And chances are, if you've read any books about the American Revolution, more especially ones that focus on what's called the Northern Theater around here in the Champlain Valley, You've probably seen some of these uh, sketches before. But they've got quite a really interesting story, not only for the sketches, but what they show and what they tell us today as historians. They're uh, a pretty interesting uh, set of paintings. Uh, so without further ado, let's learn about the Von Gammon watercolors. So uh, what do they show is soldiers from Germany, Britain, and America during the Saratoga campaign. And what is the Saratoga campaign? Just a, a brief background um, for those not familiar with it. It is a British attempt in 1777 to launch an invasion down the Champlain Valley designed to split the colonies in two and end the American Revolution. The British uh, theory, the British strategy is the whole revolution is caused by those troublesome people in Boston. The Sons of Liberty, John Hancock, Sam Adams, John Adams, and that whole lot. If we can separate New England from the rest of the colonies, the rest of the colonies will come back into the fold as loyal subjects of the crown, and we'll just deal with those troublemakers in Massachusetts later on. So this guy, John Burgoyne, he is a British general, and... He comes up with an idea that he publishes in a pamphlet called Thoughts on Conducting the War from Canada. And he publishes this in the winter of 1776. He had come over to the American Theater in 1775. He had seen service in, at Bunker Hill and had fought in Canada during the repulse of the American invasion in the spring of 1776. Uh, prior to that, he had had significant combat experience in the Seven Years' War, leading a British brigade in Portugal. He was a cavalry officer by training, pretty well experienced military commander. And he publishes this uh, pamphlet, Thoughts on Conducting the War from Canada, and his idea is that three British columns will converge on Albany in 1777, again in that attempt to separate New England from the rest of the colonies. One column will come west out of Oswego under Barry St. Ledger. Another column will come up the Hudson Valley 
under General Lord Howe, commanding the main British army in New York. Burgoyne himself will take another British army south out of Montreal, down the Champlain Valley, and attack from the north. Well, you know, when you're, when you're thinking about an attack through the woods of New York and Vermont from 3,000 miles away, it, you know, is something that seems pretty easy. As would be the case, it would not be too easy for Burgoyne. Uh, the British Army that was supposed to come out of New York decides to go to Philadelphia instead. So one prong is cut off. The prong that was supposed to come out of Oswego under Barry St. Ledger is repulsed at Fort Stanwix in Oriskany in central New York. That leaves Burgoyne's column coming south. Well, we have a series of engagements. Fort Ticonderoga, a major British victory on July 5th and 6th, 1777. Burgoyne is so happy he thinks he's chased all the Americans away. The following day, on July 7th, there is a very sharp rear action at Hubbardton, where part of Burgoyne's army under Simon Fraser attacks three American regiments, one of the only major battles fought on Vermont soil, but contrary to popular belief, not the only battle fought on Vermont soil during the Revolutionary War. There were several others, but not as large as Hubbardton. The result of Hubbardton, the American rear guard is defeated, but the bulk of the American army is able to escape from Ticonderoga and regroup at Castleton and Rutland, and they'll later be used that fall in the battles of Saratoga. July 8th, there's another battle found fought at Fort Ann, New York, very similar to Hubbardton. An American rear guard puts up a pretty significant action. The British are stopped at Skanesboro, Whitehall, and those two actions really stop the British momentum coming down the Champlain Valley. Burgoyne has to bring all of his supplies down the valley, down the lake, drop them off at Ticonderoga, and then bring them overland. The Americans start flooding swamps. They start cutting down trees, blocking roads, small rear actions, so much so that by the beginning of August, the momentum of Burgoyne's advance is really starting to stall. That leads to August 16th at Bennington. Burgoyne sends about 1,000 men into what is supposed to go into the Hampshire Grants, into Vermont to try to find supplies, wagons, horses. Well, we all know what happens on August 16th because we celebrate it as Bennington Day, which is actually fought in New York, mostly by troops from Vermont, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. One day, Burgoyne loses 1,000 men. The momentum continues. He eventually gets south, crosses the Hudson River, and on September 19th, fights the first battle of Saratoga. The battle is really a tactical draw. The Americans inflict more casualties on the British Army. The British feel that they've won a victory because they hold the field at nightfall when the Americans pull back. Burgoyne, he's waiting for reinforcements. The reinforcements never come. He's running out of supplies. So on October 7th, he decides to launch a reconnaissance in force to try to find the Americans. The Second Battle of Saratoga is over in the course of about 15 or 20 minutes. Benedict Arnold leads the American attack. They smash through the British defenses. The British retreat up to what is now Schuylersville, Old Saratoga back then. October 17th, the British capitulate at Saratoga. The result is France comes in, recognizes the United States as a sovereign nation, starts openly sending guns and supplies, and basically it's the turning point of the revolution. Long story short, there's a lot of books you can read on this, and I've read most of them. Next slide. So... That gets us to these Von Gammon watercolors and their importance because they actually show us what the soldiers who took part in this campaign looked like. They are some of the only contemporary illustrations from the Revolutionary period and they are showing us what these men actually looked like on campaign. Now, I graduated from high school almost 20 years ago, but my Revolutionary War part of high school in 10th grade history was 
The British were incompetent morons who came over to the colonies, stood there, and got picked off by American riflemen in trees seven miles away. That's not how it worked. The British Army, time and again, adapts to the continent. They adapt to the conditions of what they are facing here in North America. Really, the only re reason why the British lost this war was the political will of the politicians in Parliament to continue funding it, as well as a supply train that's coming from 3,000 miles away. Think of it this way. Every uniform, every bullet, everything the British are using is coming out of England and Ireland. The Americans, they're getting a lot of supplies from the Spanish, from the French, but a lot of it is being made here. All their food is coming from here. So their supply line and the will of the British public to continue this war is really the reason why they lost. But these sketches show us conclusively how the British adopted to the war in North America. Today they are a very important source by both historians and reenactors, the historians to illustrate, to show and understand this, and the reenactors to assume the identity of these soldiers by providing illustrations of them on that campaign. So Burgoyne's army, the, the thing that Friedrich von Gammon is sketching, leaves Canada with about 8,000 men. That's, that's a huge force for the time. This army is going to be constantly worn down by battle, by disease, and rear guard detachments. Now, Burgoyne thought that part of the British army that is left in Canada would eventually come down the Champlain Valley and garrison places like Point Ophir, up near Plattsburgh, would garrison Ticonderoga. That would allow him to take the bulk of his army further south. Burgoyne didn't get along with the commander-in-chief in Canada, a guy by the name of Guy Carleton. Carleton felt that as the senior officer, he should have been in command of this expedition heading south. The king overruled, put Burgoyne in. So, Cartlin basically sits up in Canada all summer with several British and German regiments that had been left behind and refuses really to send any help to Burgoyne other than what had already been uh, planned to send south. Uh, likewise, the logistics, everything's coming down the lake, goes to Ticonderoga and Skanesboro. It's then put in small carts and uh, brought overland. Burgoyne has a huge artillery train. He thought he would have to bombard Ticonderoga and Mount Independence into submission. He realizes when the Americans up and vanish on the night of July 5th into July 6th that that artillery is not needed. So most of that artillery is uh, left behind at Ticonderoga. Some of it is eventually sent back up north to Canada. And the artillery that's brought south is smaller uh, pieces, 3, 6, and 12 pounders, um, that will eventually become surrendered at Saratoga, and a number of those pieces still survive today. Uh, Burgoyne does have a uh, decent-sized staff, and it's very interesting because his army is composed of two divisions, one division of British, one division of Germans. Well, basically none of the English speak German, basically none of the Germans speak English. So to work between the two, they actually use French as a lingua franca to speak between the two uh, divisions of the army. Uh, this guy right here is Lieutenant John Ross. He commanded the 34th Regiment of Foot Grenadier Company, and he actually spilled blood on Vermont soil. He was uh, severely wounded at Hubbardton and was sent back up north to Canada and later in the war would command a Loyalist uh, regiment out of Canada. Uh, the uniform he's wearing is typical of what British officers would have worn during the French and Indian, the Seven Years' War. Uh, very elegant with all the lace, the sash, uh, the grenadier's hat. Uh, not quite what you would have seen uh, later on during the American uh, Revolution. So, again, Burgoyne's army is composed of uh, two divisions. The right wing is under this guy, Major General William Phillips, and his army is split into three brigades. The advance corps is the 24th Foot, Grenadiers Light Infantry, and the Select Marksmen. 
I, would, I will add that a British regiment at this time is composed of ten companies. Eight of those companies are what are called uh, hat men or battalion soldiers. Uh, these are what we typically think of, of men who stand shoulder to shoulder and with muskets and shoot it out with each other. One company is composed of light infantry. And these were guys who were taught to spread out, make use of the terrain, make use of certain features to fight uh, what was called Indian style. And the Grenadiers, which you might be familiar with from the movies, they wear those tall bearskin hats. Uh, today they're the people who guard the Queen. And those were tall soldiers, those were the shock troops. But what Burgoyne does is he takes all of the light infantry from these regiments, pairs them together along with the grenadiers to make these two battalions. Um, likewise, the 1st Brigade is the 20th, 21st, and 62nd. The 2nd Brigade is the 9th, 47th, and 53rd. This changes significantly as the Saratoga campaign goes on because the 53rd foot is going to be left behind to garrison Fort Ticonderoga. The 47th foot is going to be left behind to garrison uh, supply dumps at Lake George and along Burgoyne's route heading south. So going into the first battle of Saratoga, it's the 20th, the 21st, the 62nd, and the 9th. That British brigade is pretty much destroyed in the first battle of Saratoga. Uh, the 62nd foot loses nearly two-thirds of its men in about an hour of combat against Poor's New Hampshire Brigade. Uh, very heavy casualties for the time. Uh, likewise, the uh, Germans are on the second division or the left wing. Now, when we typically think of uh, the German uh, mercenaries, uh, so to say, what Thomas Jefferson embodied in the Declaration of in Independence coming over here to fight for the British, typically we're thinking of what we call, we lump them together as the Hessians. Well, most of these guys are actually from Brunswick, and one, another one of those German states that sent men over here to fight under British command. They, they are led by this guy, Major General Friedrich Adolf von Rydesel, and uh, he is a very competent uh, commander, but he hated John Burgoyne. These two men did not get along at all. Um, Rydesel... The, these German soldiers, these are professional Germans. Uh, some of them probably have more combat experience than the British. They had fought in the Seven Years' War on the continent against France. Uh, Rydazel was a very competent officer. But he feels that Burgoyne sort of dismisses his German soldiers as second-line soldiers. Rydazel's men are basically going to save Simon Fraser from being overrun at the Battle of Hubbardton. They come up at the last minute and save the day. So these guys knew what they were doing. Uh, likewise, three brigades, um, Rett, Specht, Rydazel, Friedrich. This regiment here, the Erb Prince Regiment, is actually interesting because it's from a small German principality called Hess Hanau, which was separate from Hess Castle, which uh, comprises most of the German uh, units. So uh, Arab Prince is uh, one of those uh, units, and that is the regiment that uh, the guy we're talking about, Friedrich von Gammon, uh, is in command of, a company. So who is uh, Friedrich von Gammon? Well, he during this campaign, he is serving as a captain in the Arab Prince Regiment from Hesse Hanau. Uh, he, was, he lived 50 years. Uh, he s pretty much spent his entire adult life in the army. Uh, back then, you were commissioned in your teenage years, and you served uh, pretty much for life. And that's what uh, Von Gammon uh, does. He uh, is captured at Saratoga in 1781, uh, skirts in the army as a lieutenant colonel upon his death, and as will be seen, he is a skilled artist. And the one thing he didn't do was provide us with a sketch of himself. So this is what he would have looked like in the uniform of a captain in the Arab Prince Regiment from Hess Hanau uh, during the Saratoga campaign. Typically, when we think of the American Revolution, a lot of our ideas of what these people were wearing come from the series of paintings 
that hang in the U.S. Capitol done by Trumbull. And these were done in the 1820s, 1830s. Very, very different than what would have been worn during the American Revolutionary period. But this is typical of the post-revolutionary generation and their interpretation of what folks were wearing uh, during the war. <clears throat> the British soldiers during the Revolution, what they're wearing is based on what's called the 1768 Warrant. And these uniforms were approved by George III. And this is basically saying what the British Army should be looking like. Uh, the 1768 warrant is based on experience that had been uh, shown during the French and Indian War. Uh, instead of those really uh, baggy uh, coats, a lot of lace, epaulets, these are much more tight-fitting, much more uh, cut-down uniforms. That, and they are designed for a parade ground. They are designed uh, for Europe. They're not really thought of when this comes into effect in 1768 for a war that might be fought on the continent in North America. British soldiers received one uniform per year. Typically, the new uniforms were issued out in June. Why June? The king's birthday. The king would have a parade. He'd want all the soldiers to look nice. He'd go by and review and go back to the castle and com start complaining about the Americans again. But... The British uniforms of 1768, they have red as a background, but they also have, every regiment has a specific facing color, and you'll see this later on in the sketches, along with lace, and every regiment has a unique button. Every British soldier's coat has about 40 to 44 buttons on it. These buttons are still found throughout the Champlain Valley. So we know, for example, if a button from the 34th foot is found down at Mount Independence. Well, there are only two companies from the 34th foot there. So it came from one of those soldiers. Likewise with the 24th. Every regiment has their own button, their own belt buckle, etc. There's really uh, no uniformity what we uh, think of other than they had red coats on. These are two British soldiers based on the 1768 warrant. And these are two men, an officer over here and a grenadier, and these are from the 62nd Regiment of Foot that would have come with Burgoyne. Uh, the 62nd was pretty much destroyed in the first battle of Saratoga. We see on the grenadier, he's got the tall grenadier's hat on, he's got his uh, breeches that are buff color, uh, the facing color of the regiment is buff. He's got his uh, waist belt, carrying a sword, a bayonet, his musket. Uh, we see the officer uh, wearing a uh, very interesting hat. The uh, uniform returns uh, continuously complained that the 62nd Foot's officers had really small hats. Um, quite, quite interesting to the regiment. Likewise, the officer is wearing a sword. Uh, they're wearing uh, gaiters. Uh, they have breeches on with long stockings, uh, black uh, gaiters to go over their shoes. Also notice the length of the coat coming down mid-thigh almost to the knee. Um, keep, this, uh, keep this picture in mind as we go along. This is what British soldiers would have looked like going into the American Revolution. Things very quickly changed when they got over here to North America. Likewise, this is the Germans. This is a sketch not done by von Gammon of the Herb Prince Regiment uh, shortly before they embarked to come over to North America as part of the uh, German contingent. Uh, from left to right, we've got an officer, uh, typical of what uh, von Gammon would have looked like. We have a sergeant, we have a grenadier, we have a musket man, and a drummer. Uh, drummers, both German and British, wore very elaborate coats with a lot of lace on them because when the shooting's starting, a lot of uh, white smoke, commands are given by the drum. An officer would want to be able to find a drummer very quickly because when the shooting starts, very hard to give voice commands, so the men are taught to respond to command by drum. 
but this gives us a typical look of what the Germans would have looked like uh, before they came over here. Uh, likewise, a really nice uh, detailed sketch of a German grenadier. I should have added, a uh, German regiment is uh, five musket companies uh, and one grenadier company. The German regiments are slightly bigger than uh, the British companies. The British company was about 50 men, a German company is about 100. So they were uh, small, less companies, but more men in each. So this is a uh, typical uh, Hessian uh, grenadier, what they would have looked like uh, be before coming over to uh, North America. Uh, probably the most interesting thing is the miter hat, uh, also known as the grenadier hat. Um, I've always thought it looked like a tin can with a pom-pom that uh, you're wearing on your head. Um, you know, really good for the parade ground, not really good when you're fighting in the Battle of Bennington. You'll notice the German cartridge box. Grenadiers get their names because they were originally the guys who, the tall guys who were supposed to lead the attack and throw hand grenades. So you keep your hand grenades in this large cartridge box. By the time of the Revolutionary War, they're not really throwing hand grenades anymore, but they keep the large cartridge box uh, embellished with a big plate, the, the grenadier's badge, um, and that holds a lot of ammunition, almost 50 to 60 rounds. Uh, very nice uh, white gaiters, uh, again, for the parade ground, those would have been soiled very quickly. Uh, we, we carry here our, what's called the Tornister, which is a backpack. Uh, knapsack would have uh, carried part of his uh, camp supplies. Uh, these men live in, in what are called messes of between four to five soldiers. So one soldier carries uh, the tent. One soldier carries the tent poles. Another one carries uh, the, the uh, pot that they use. This guy is carrying an axe. And look, he's got tent pegs hanging from his cartridge box. So he's carrying part of his equipment. We also have here a haversack and the uh, musket. Now, a lot of this stuff is going to be captured from the Brunswick detachment that is defeated by Stark at Bennington on August 16th. And uh, Stark sends trophies out to New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Vermont. Uh, if you go to the New Hampshire Historical Society, they still have uh, the Hessian helmet, the Hessian cartridge box. Likewise, Massachusetts has their Bennington trophies. Nobody knows where Vermont went. They disappeared in the 1830s. Whether they were thrown away or they burned down in one of the fires at the State House, nobody knows, but we celebrate Bennington as this great Vermont thing, but we have no idea where our Bennington trophies went, except for the cannon that's in front of the State House and the other one that's down in the Bennington Museum, the two three-pounders. <clears throat> so, the 1777 campaign. So, Burgoyne, again, was over in... England comes back and starts pulling his forces from all over Canada to converge on Montreal to get ready for the invasion down the Champlain Valley. But Burgoyne arrives and he realizes that his regiments, especially the British, are still wearing their 1776 uniforms. What happened to the new uniforms? We're about to go on this campaign and some of these British soldiers are literally wearing rags, the leftover uniforms from the previous year. Where'd they go? Thank this guy, John Paul Jones in the US Navy. Uh, John Paul Jones is uh, operating off of the uh, Nova Scotia coast when his ship intercepts a British convoy carrying supplies to Canada for Burgoyne's army. They capture the British uniforms that are supposed to go to Burgoyne's army in 1777. Well, what John Paul Jones does is sails those uniforms to Boston, and they're actually issued to Continental soldiers. So Americans end up wearing British uniforms that had been intended for Burgoyne. Uh, these uniforms are going to be dyed brown. Uh, you don't want any friendly fire incidents but they literally still have the lace, the buttons, 
everything that just died uh, brown um, by order of Washington. So Burgoyne has uh, this dilemma. It's uh, April, May, 1777, and uh, he needs uh, to outfit his men to go on the war path. What's he going to do? British orders issued on April 6th. The clothing for the several regiments not being arrived, His Excellency the Commander-in-Chief allows the commanding officers of battalions to accommodate the present clothing as shall be most convenient for the men, and it is to be repaired so as to serve the campaign until the new clothing arrives. Well, what's that mean? Make do with what you got. We've got, you've got the old clothing, we don't know when the new clothing is coming, so try to get it in the best order possible so we can go on campaign. So what they're going to do is take their coats. Remember those coats were uh, mid, mid thigh length, almost to the knee. They're going to cut them down to waist length into what's called jackets. They're going to take the extra material that they've cut down and they're going to patch and literally patch the hell out of those 1776 clothes. <clears throat> they're going to take their cocked hats and they're going to do something very interesting with those. Some British regiments are going to go a step farther. They're going to make a small ornaments to put on their hats. This is one from the 62nd that was found uh, at Saratoga. So again, this shows the British Army is adapting. They don't have any new clothes. They're about to go on campaign. They have to get ready. <clears throat> Thomas Anbury served in Burgoyne's army as an ensign in the 24th Regiment of Foot. Uh, there are some problems with his account, especially with uh, his description of what happens at Hubbardton. I won't go into detail on that, but it was published in Vermont <laughs> History about 10 years ago. Basically, he... At Hubbard Inn, he was in three places at once, and we have no idea where he actually was or if he was actually there or back at Ticonderoga. But he does provide some good details of what the British Army is doing, and even British officers are making these changes. Uh, British officers are cutting down their coats. British officers are cutting down their hats. They're also leaving their swords behind up in Canada. They're uh, going out and British officers had to buy their own equipment and they're <laughs> buying uh, light carbines, fusees, small uh, muskets, uh, 60, 62 caliber muskets to carry with them on campaign. So they're le <laughs> even the officers are doing this, but this is uh, rather comical. The regiments have the hair that is affixed to their caps of different colors. Ours is red, and as the purest white here takes the best color, several soldiers, ambitious to have theirs superior to the rest, occasions a very ludicrous affray between Mex and the inhabitants in which the soldiers were worsted and got a severe beating. <coughs> Little background, one night these British soldiers went out to this uh, farm, tried to get some horse hair off this uh, French-Canadian farmer, and uh, he went out and uh, gave him a good shellacking with a shillelagh or something. Don't steal from, uh, from them. So the British are, again, they're getting their hats ready, getting ready uh, for uh, heading south. And the hat is probably the most interesting uh, thing that they do for this campaign. If it wasn't for Von Gehrmann's paintings, we wouldn't have any idea of what they look like. They uh, take the cocked hat, the tricorn hat, you're probably pretty familiar with, and they convert it into a light infantry helmet. The light infantry companies that fight with Burgoyne, they're already wearing helmets. Uh, this is one that's worn by a soldier in the 9th Regiment of Foot, so they retain theirs. We have no idea what the Grenadier companies with Burgoyne wore. Uh, they leave, obviously, those tall bearskin hats back up in Canada, but there's a lot of disagreement between Fraser and Phillips that basically every Grenadier company is wearing something different on their head, and we have absolutely no idea what they were wearing. So this is the hat that Burgoyne comes up with. A uh, rather interesting uh, design. This was actually taken on my kitchen table um, a few years ago. But it's uh, got a curved, 
curved front, the uh, cockade, and it's got this uh, horse hair crest that is dyed the facing color of the regiment. So this is from the 24th uh, foot. And it just shows you how they are able, how the British Army, before they leave Canada, is able to make use of their old uniforms and convert them for the campaign. <clears throat> Here's our first uh, set of uh, Von Gammon watercolors. We see a soldier in the 24th, the Royal Artillery, and the 21st. We see how the British were able to make do with those old uniforms and convert them. Again, <laughs> we have a waist-length jacket. Underneath, we still have a vest. The bayonet belt. Remember that uh, the sketch of the 62nd foot. The bayonet belt is now worn over the shoulder so it doesn't get caught up on rocks and trees fighting in the woods. The hat. The Royal Artillery, <coughs> even though these guys are mostly manning the guns with Burgoyne's army, they're also carrying muskets for protection of those cannon in case some of the other regiments uh, could not uh, participate. The details on these sketches is amazing. We know that the Royal Artillery, they wore white cartridge boxes that also doubled as uh, fuse pouches for the uh, cannon. We see, we see the, white, uh, the white cartridge box there. The details on the lace. Uh, Von Hermann, probably painting with a, literally a toothpick, is painting some of the details of the lace. Uh, here on the 24th foot soldier, we see a, a narrow green stripe, an epaulette, on his uh, shoulder lined with lace. Again, amazing, amazing details in these paintings. What do the Germans do, however? They don't make really any changes at all uh, to their uniforms. Some of the equipment from Germany actually gets to Montreal in time to outfit some of the Germans. So they don't have to take as many changes as the British do going into this campaign. They still wore this heavy equipment, those huge cartridge boxes, uh, the swords, you'll notice, but the Brunswick Dragoons, and history has lambasted the British, the Burgoyne, the Dragoons that Burgoyne took with him uh, since the Battle of Bennington. Well, they brought these huge swords with them down from Canada. Why do they need that? There's not enough horses to outfit the Dragoons to go south out of Canada. All available horses are being used to drag Burgoyne's artillery. It's being used to drag Burgoyne's wagon train. So the idea was that the Dragoons would find horses along the way. Hence why we have the Battle of Bennington, where the Dragoons go back and fight, looking for horses in Vermont, they end up getting defeated. What they do change, however, is their trousers. Uh, they wore, much like the British, white wool breeches. Not really something that's that effective for summer campaigning. So they decide to make a new pair of pants to wear. And uh, Captain Posh is in command of a Hess-Hanau artillery battery. And he writes... There was ordered long, loose, and wide linen overalls, such as sailors wear, to be made in one piece from one end to the other, and to be made of the same length as leggings. They were mostly made of old tents. I found this clothing well adapted to the climate and our present situation. They were particularly convenient not only for marching, but as protection against insects. Well, you live up here long enough, you know about mosquitoes and black flies. So... These uh, trousers are going to be adopted by both the British and the Germans to be worn uh, in the campaign. They're made out of uh, old tents, uh, typical of the A-frame tent that we see uh, British soldiers uh, wearing. And you could get several pair of these trousers out of each uh, tent. 
and this shows uh, Pasha's artillery in action at the first battle of Saratoga, and we see the men uh, wearing those trousers and some British Royal Artillerymen uh, coming to their rescue. Uh, but again, these trousers are adopted by both British and Germans uh, for the campaign. <clears throat> so the, now that we know about Burgoyne's army, about what they were wearing, how they adapted, let's talk about the paintings themselves. There's been a lot of debate among historians since these paintings really came to light. When were they painted? We know they were painted sometime during the American Revolution, between 1776 and 1781. However, research most likely indicates that they were painted in a very short window in Montreal before Burgoyne's army left heading south down Lake Champlain. Why, you may ask, is because the amount of the paintings. This time in Montreal was the only time that the British and German regiments were all together in one place. And it's really the only time when von Germann would have had the time to paint before going out on campaign. His commander is Colonel uh, Wilhelm von Gaul, uh, commander of the Arab Prince Regiment, uh, captured at Saratoga, and he would have been the one that would have allowed von Germann to paint in his free time. So these paintings show the British uni units in particular right before the campaign starts. Uh, before they start taking casualties, uh, the uniforms are pretty crisp. I mean, they have been cut down from 1776, but they're not really worn out rags as they would appear later in the, during the capitulation in October of 77. So most of these are painted in Canada before the army leaves going south, and they're going to be carried with him throughout the Saratoga campaign. So it's pretty amazing that he was able to do this before he left Canada. <clears throat> Who did he paint? There are 22 of these paintings in total. He's going to paint the 20th, 21st, 24th, 47th, 53rd, and 62nd British regiments, a Royal Artillery soldier, a British soldier in winter uniform, and a member of the 84th foot. Again, going in with why these were painted in Montreal before he left, the 84th is composed of Scottish soldiers who had settled in Canada. They don't go south with Burgoyne. The only time he would have had contact with an 84th foot soldier was in Montreal. Likewise, painting some of the German units, the Dragoons, the Friedrich von Rydesel, Rex, Spett, Herb Prince, the Light Infantry Battalion, the Brunswick Jaeger, a Hessian Jaeger, again, getting to my point, the Hessian Jaegers actually go to Oswego and head out with Barry St. Ledger. They don't go with Burgoyne, but the Brunswick Jaegers do. They actually basically save Fraser's men at Hubbardton. He also paints the uh, Hessian artillery. Uh, three paintings that are not, uh, not British or German that are actually really interesting. He paints a nice little sketch of a French-Canadian farmer that we'll see later on. And two more that he paints are American soldiers. He painted those American soldiers after the surrender, when they would have had contact with Americans. So 22 in total. And here are some of them. The Herb Prince Regiment that he is serving with. Uh, Brunswick Regiment von Speck and the Prince Friedrich Regiment. Now, think back to those uh, British sketches that we saw. How the British converted their uniforms. Look at the Germans. They're still wearing a tricorn hat. They're still wearing very long coats. Um, those coattails can get caught up pretty easily uh, walking through woods and stuff uh, out here. They're still carrying uh, swords. All of the British, including the officers and the grenadiers, they left their swords back up in Canada. Uh, the British grenadiers were issued out tomahawks. The uh, British officers uh, simply carried bayonets or nothing at all besides uh, the carbines that they bought up in Canada. So we see them carrying swords, which are not really 
practical when you're walking through the woods. We also see the uh, pants, the trousers that uh, Captain Posh uh, wrote about uh, when he uh, talked about how they converted their uh, trousers. So that's really the only big change that the Germans are doing to get ready uh, for this uh, campaign. Uh, we still have a very tall, high neck stock, uh, typical uh, worn by both British and German soldiers. Uh, the heavy cartridge box carrying all that ammunition. But, um, you know, some sketches that uh, von Gammon did that show uh, what the Germans uh, did to get ready, which really wasn't much besides their pants. Uh, two, uh, two units that are uh, very familiar uh, to us Vermonters, the Brunswick Dragoons uh, compose the bulk of the British force that goes to Bennington, which Bennington is down here, but the battle's actually fought in New York over here. Um, so this shows the Brunswick uh, Dragoons, and they're carrying shorter muskets, carbines, because, again, they were supposed to be on horseback. Uh, they're still carrying the very large sword. Again, they were supposed to go out and find horses, and they would get on these horses, and it was thought with these big swords that are nearly three feet long, they could just scare the Americans and ride them down. Almost 150 of these swords are captured at Saratoga, uh, some are taken away by Americans, some are given away by Stark as trophies, but most of these swords are actually issued to the Continental Army Dragoons. A lot of this equipment that's captured at Saratoga, at Bennington, is reissued out uh, to American units, especially, uh, we know, those swords. Um, again, showing what the, uh, what the British, uh, the German soldiers were wearing. Uh, this large white strap on the Brunswick uh, Dragoon Soldier is actually not a cartridge box. The cartridge box is here. These are really small cartridge boxes, only holding about 20 rounds of ammunition. Primarily, they're mounted. You're supposed to use the sword. This right here is actually what's called a carbine sling. He's supposed to be on a horse, so this sling would hook, would hook up to a little ring on his carbine, and he could use it while he was mounted. So again, this shows that the Brunswick Dragoon Battalion was fully supposed to come down on this campaign and find their own horses. A uh, pretty important sketch for that reason. The Brunswick Jaeger, we see the, the short, stocky uh, Jaeger rifle that they were using. This is the, there's about a hundred of these guys this is the only unit in Burgoyne's army that is actually armed with rifles. Uh, everyone else is using smoothbore muskets. Uh, this unit actually saves the day at Hubbardton. They come up on the American uh, left flank uh, just when it looks like Warner's regiment is about to push back the British. Uh, they take position behind a uh, fence and fire some well-placed shots that probably kill Colonel Francis and the Americans retreat. So they played a pretty prominent role uh, at Hubbardton. But again, two regiments uh, very closely associated uh, with Vermont. Uh, some more uh, sketches. Uh, the uh, Rydazel Regiment, again showing the sword, the musket, uh, the pom-pom on the hat, which I always uh, think is interesting. And this is actually a British soldier wearing a winter uniform, uh, probably done by von Gammon from either memory or, you know, it's still, as we know up here, it's still pretty cold in May. So the British might have been wearing this uniform in May when these sketches uh, were done. Uh, he's wearing a pair of blue leggings, a uh, fur cap, and also a converted blanket that has been made into a coat. Uh, he's also going to do two very interesting sketches of Americans. Uh, this sketch shows an enlisted man of the 11th Massachusetts Regiment. Uh, this is one of the American regiments that fights at Hubbardton. Uh, most of these guys were actually from Maine, but Maine was part of Massachusetts until about 1820. So this shows an American soldier uh, from the 11th Massachusetts, and this was probably sketched 
after the surrender at Saratoga. Likewise, an American officer uh, wearing a uh, almost a black blackish uniform with uh, red piping. It's thought that this might be an artillery officer from Stevens Artillery uh, Battalion that fought at Saratoga and wore uh, black uniforms face uh, with red. Likewise, we see the American officer uh, carrying a musket and a bayonet. Uh, something that uh, they would have done, not just uh, besides uh, swords. Uh, another uh, one of the sketches of a British soldier from the 47th uh, Regiment. Uh, we know that by the white facing on his coat. Again, the details that I uh, spoke about, you can see the lacing on the coat. Little ruffles on the so shoulder shirt that uh, would have been seen. Uh, the 47th surrenders at Saratoga but they had left a number of companies along the way guarding supplies near Lake George. So, what happened to these 22 sketches? Where did they go? Well, Von Germann carries these paintings with him during the Revolutionary War. They're with him in, during the Saratoga campaign, but he's captured as a prisoner of war at Saratoga. He's released in 1781 and goes back to Canada. 1782, he gives these paintings to a guy named Adolphe Du Roy, who is the adjutant of the Brunswick Detachment. And he gives them these paintings to go back to Canada. Uh, Von Gammon himself will go back to Canada and stay in the army again till his death as a lieutenant colonel. Well, Du Roy owns these paintings until 1823, when he dies. Du Roy bequeaths them to a major hostler. What does Hostler do with these paintings? Well, in 1851, he is going to loan them to the Brunswick Municipal Archives. And a very talented artist there is actually going to make copies of all 22 of the Von Gammon paintings. And returns the originals to Major Hostler. And a set of these was, because, again, we don't have any copy machines, we don't have really photography, is in its infancy. So if you want a copy of something, you have to sketch it yourself. So this artist from the Brunswick Archives copies the paintings that Von Gammon had done in 1777. So they're copied, they're put in the archives, and then, lo and behold, the originals disappear. The actual paintings that Von Gammon did in Montreal and during the Saratoga aftermath simply up and disappear. Where on earth did they go? One theory that's out there, thank the 8th Air Force and the RAF, carpet bombing Germany during World War II. They might have been blown up somewhere in Germany where they might have ended up. Likewise. American GIs like to take a lot of things home with them. Uh, pretty much, they were even able to bring German heavy machine guns back with them. That's how liberal the American Army was with their uh, trophy policy. Who knows? An American GI might have seen these sketches, thought, hey, these are really nice, and they might have been brought back to the United States by an American GI during uh, World War II. Either way, the original 1777 Von Gammon paintings have not been seen since 1851. So if they had not been copied by that artist at the Brunswick Archives, we would not have what we have today. So nobody really knows about these things until this guy, William L. Stone, comes into the picture. And he is the first real historian of the Saratoga campaign. Uh, Saratoga was forgotten about for a while until a guy wrote a book about 10 battles that changed the world. Uh, among them was Waterloo, Marathon, uh, Carthage, the uh, Carthaginian Wars. But Saratoga makes that list because it's recognized even in the 1860s and 70s as really the turning point of the American Revolution, the battle that gained us French recognition and eventual independence. 
So William L. Stone is the first, what we would consider, historian of this campaign. He published several important books about it, including Pasha's journal. He spent a number of years living in Germany, where he found uh, Pasha's journal and a number of other important uh, German texts from the American Revolution. And one day, he's in the Brunswick archives, going through a box, and pulls out the copies of the von Gammon paintings. And the Germans won't let him take these paintings back to New York, where he's from. So what does he do? He commissions his own paintings. So there are some differences between the paintings that are in Brunswick, the ones that were copied direct from von Gammon, and the paintings that Stone commissions based on those copies. There are uh, some differences, uh, most noticeably be, uh, in the Arab Prince Regiment sketch, but he doesn't copy all 22 of them. He's primarily interested in the German uh, contingent, the Hessians, the Brunswickers in the American Revolution. So they copy all the German sketches. He's, he looks at the British soldiers, and all these British soldiers look the same, so I'm just going to copy one of them. So they only copy the 62nd, the Royal Artillery, and the two sketches of the Americans. And he uses these in uh, some of his books that he publishes about the Saratoga campaign and the originals that Stone had sketched from the ones in Brunswick are on deposit at the New York Public Library uh, Special Collections. And that's uh, William uh, L. Stone right there. So we thank him for finding uh, those sketches. But... For years, we thought that those were the only ones. Uh, Stone uh, copied these, and these were you the ones that are on a display at the New York Public Library were thought for decades to be the only von Gammon sketches that survived. And they were used in many publications about the uh, American Revolution. And I was obviously not using spell check on this slide, I apologize. Um, this is the, uh, the neat one that I, uh, that I told you about, the, uh, the French-Canadian uh, farmer. Um, I'm Canadian Bauer, which I think translates as a Canadian farmer. Um, he's wearing a, you know, a, a converted blanket that's been made into a coat. He's wearing a pair of uh, Native American moccasins. He's got a, an Indian sash around his waist, uh, smoking his pipe, and just uh, trying to survive another uh, brutal Canadian winter. Um, and uh, gaiters, uh, socks, probably a pair of um, uh, something. But, you know, really, again, fantastic detail. And I don't know what's up with the, uh, the broken fence in the background, but um, he's just chilling out up in Montreal, having a good time. <clears throat> so, again... We, we thought these were the only ones of, out there until Stephen Strack comes into the picture in the 1990s. Uh, Strack is a National Park Service historian, and uh, he had been commissioned uh, to really uh, carry on with the project that had begun in the 1930s with the WPA. Uh, the WPA commissions a project for a group of American historians to go over to Germany in 1933-1934, right as Hitler is coming to power, to go through German archives and copy records relating to German soldiers that had fought in the American Revolution. And they copy a ton of material from the Hessian archives, from the Brunswick archives, put it on microfilm, and send it back to the National Archives. Very lucky they did that because nearly all those records disappear during the carpet bombing of Germany during World War II. So Strack is a Park Service historian. Military history is his thing. And he is sent over to Germany to really carry on this project that had begun in the 1930s to find uh, records uh, relating to the German participation during the American Revolution. He goes to the Brunswick archives, and aha, he finds all 22 of the sketches. There are more von Gammon sketches out there than had previously been seen. Because in the United States, we had been using the copies that Stone had put at the New York Public Library. Stephen Strack finds 
all 22 sketches. Um, by this time in the 1990s, early 2000s, uh, we have high quality scanners. He's able to get scans of all 22 paintings and reproductions are now available. So we have all 22 of them uh, available and the Brunswick Archives uh, graciously has allowed for their publication. So the value for historians. These are some of the most detailed sketches of British, German, and American troops during the Revolutionary War. They show that the British changed their dress and tactics to the continent, to North America, especially the British. This is a soldier from the 62nd Regiment. And again, the amazing details that are in these paintings uh, show us their value uh, today. They're also going to be used uh, contemporarily by uh, his reenactors. Uh, that sketch of the American soldier from the 11th Massachusetts. This is a coat based on that sketch of the 11th uh, Massachusetts soldier. Remember what I said, how the British, they wore their waist belts on their waist, and then by the time of the Saratoga campaign, they're using them over the shoulder. This shows how they were able to cut down part of that leather belt and convert it to shoulder use. Uh, likewise, a uh, soldier from the uh, 60, uh, 53rd foot, uh, a Fort Ticonderoga employee uh, who shall remain nameless, um, that, I, uh, that I took the uh, liberty of using a sketch um, showing what a British soldier uh, would have looked like uh, on campaign. Very uh, likewise, uh, a group of men from the, uh, the 24th uh, reenacted regiment, um, and this was taken about three years ago. The uh, guy back here with the glasses on was drawing a bead on the uh, director, Dan O'Neill, um, who was uh, in the middle of running away. Um, I did reenact uh, British for a few years up here, but uh, shows uh, how reenactors are able uh, to you base their impression off of these uh, sketches. And again, a Royal Artillery soldier, uh, unnamed uh, British soldier, right there. Uh, and we are actually pulling a three pound cannon up Mount Defiance. Um, the British dragged 12 pounders up there. Let me tell you, with about, even about a dozen people dragging a little three-pounder from the parking lot up to the top of the hill, that was, uh, that was pretty hot work on a, uh, on a July afternoon. Um, but again, showing that the, uh, these, uh, these paintings are, uh, are still valuable uh, for us today. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Well, the, in this campaign in particular, it's cutting the uniforms down. It's uh, cutting the hats down, making them into almost like light infantry helmets. Uh, wearing uh, trousers with gaiters attached instead of breeches. Um, this isn't just going on in, Sa in the Saratoga campaign in 1777. Uh, British units throughout the war, they uh, wear what are called roundabout jackets, which are like waist-length uh, coats. They wear uh, round hats, uh, sort of like a slouch hat. Um, they're really, you know, converting their uniforms throughout the revolutionary period. Uh, officers are leaving their swords behind. They're carrying muskets, just like their men, um, really not to be used, but as a symbol of authority. Um, so the British Army is adapting time and again for uh, the continent. And we really don't have a lot of sketches of those other campaigns. There's a few sketches uh, by uh, Xavier Delegata uh, showing British soldiers in Philadelphia in 1777. Again, showing those waist-length coats, the round hats. But especially as the war progresses into the Carolinas in uh, 1779, 1780, you know, it's very hot down south. Um, we, we have descriptions of what they're wearing, but we don't really have actual sketches. So what complements the, the Von Gammon sketches, we know they were converting their uniforms. We know they were cutting them down. 
We know they were making their hats, going out and stealing horse here to put in them. But this backs up what they were actually doing. Yes, sir. Uh, you referred to helmets. Were they actually made of something that was supposed to protect them against bullets? No, no. They they are they are made out of leather. They're made out of uh, tin. There's no there's no body armor in, in any of these brass. Um, they're the white infantry hats might protect against uh, cavalry saber slashes down on the head. Some of them have uh, chain mail on them, but by the time the war goes on, they're really abandoning them for uh, felt hats like everyone else is wearing. Um, Burgoyne's light infantry, they already had the, the light infantry hats, and we know several uh, from the ninth foot, for example, that survived, so we know what they were wearing uh, there. Yes, sir. So when did Stone do his work? Uh, Stone was active uh, in the 1860s, 1870s. Um, he's also going to be the guy who gets the monument built at Saratoga commemorating the surrender. Um, but most of his books are published uh, 1860s, 1870s, so right after the Civil War. They're um, pretty, uh, pretty hard to find today, but reprints are available. Google Books is the best thing that ever came around, especially for uh, historians. Uh, yes, sir? They were, in the winter of 1777, they were spread way out. You know, you got to remember, even the winters here in Vermont, you know, there's not a lot of infrastructure in Canada back then. You know, Montreal and Quebec are the two biggest cities, but they don't, they don't have enough houses. They're not sleeping in tents in the middle of a Canadian winter. They're sleeping in buildings. There's not enough buildings to support the British forces. So they're spread out for, in three rivers in Montreal, Quebec City, so it takes a while for Burgoyne's army to get all to Montreal to head south. So it's not until mid-June when the ice is finally melted, when everything's ready, when Burgoyne finally leaves. And he leaves Canada on June 20th. Yes, sir. Uh, they would have been, all of those soldiers would have been in Montreal I mean, they would have been spread out, you know, in different parts of Montreal with their brigades and divisions. But he would, as an officer, he would have been able to come and go and uh, would have been able, you know, permission-wise to sketch soldiers. He did miss several regiments. Unfortunately, we don't have a grenadier. We don't have a light infantry soldier. Um, there were a number of Native American I allies, Indians, with Burgoyne's army. He didn't sketch any of them. So we are missing... We are missing quite a few, but we, we know what we know from the overall picture, and we're lucky we have those 22. Yes, sir. So, German was a prisoner of war from 1777 until 1781. Yes. Several years. Yes. But, so, where were, was the, where were they now? Uh, so, after, so, after the surrender of the British at Saratoga... The, uh, articles, the articles of surrender at Saratoga were basically the British are going to lay down, and I use British to go with the Germans as well, lay down their arms, march to Boston, get on a ship and go back to Germany and England, and they wouldn't fight in North America for the rest of the Revolutionary War. That's the terms that Burgoyne surrendered to. Burgoyne actually is allowed to go back to England right away to defend himself before the king, this is the first time in British history a British army ever surrendered. So for about a year, in the winter of 1777-1778, the uh, British and German soldiers are housed um, in Boston, in actual houses. They had surrendered their guns, their you know swords, etc. A, a number of those, especially the uh, British, escape. Uh, there's a British army in Newport, Rhode Island at the time. A number of them escape there. A number of them um, are able to uh, just, you know, work their way out of camp and go back to New York. So almost half the British force eventually will, uh, what's called an honorable desertion, because it's deserting with the intention of going back and fighting with the British army. Well, Congress gets around to ratifying the... Convention of Saratoga, 
And there, are, there's been several books written about this, but long story short, the number of muskets and accoutrements that were surrendered didn't match up with the number of soldiers that surrendered. Because a number of these British soldiers, uh, you know, sell their weapons to the Americans, the Americans walk away with them. So the British, the Congress basically says, well, you didn't surrender enough muskets, enough wet articles of war. Likewise, the British refused to recognize the Convention of Saratoga because if they recognized the Convention of Saratoga, they're recognizing the United States of America as a sovereign nation that forced one of their armies to surrender. Long story short, the summer of 1778, the British forces, the Germans, are moved to Rutland, Massachusetts for a few months. Then after that, they are moved down to Charlottesville, Virginia. And Rydazel actually becomes friends with Thomas Jefferson and dying several times at Monticello. Uh, so they're in Virginia for uh, a few years till 1781 when they're moved back, when they're moved up to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And the, uh, by this point, most of the officers are allowed uh, to go on parole and go back. So that's when Von Gammon goes back to Canada. Uh, with the sketches that he had carried all the time. Uh, the prisoners of war that had been captured at Yorktown are also sent to Lancaster. Well, what do we have in Lancaster? Most of the Germans are sent there, and they're like, hey, there's people here who speak German, the Amish and the Mennonites. So a lot of them are like, hmm, do I want to go back to Germany and be a feudal peasant farmer, or do I want to become a pacifist and live in Pennsylvania? So almost a third of, and the, the numbers vary based on what I've seen, but almost a quarter to a third of the Hessians, um, you know, end up staying here in America. So it's a very long answer to that, but there's been several books written, um, uh, most prominently after Saratoga and the Convention Army, um, that provide good answers. I think we'll hold it there. If some of you would like to talk to Robert more, more at length afterwards, or he'll be here for a few more minutes. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, our sponsors, which I forgot to do at the beginning. Uh, People's United Bank, Rice Lumber Company, Burlington Cars, and 802 Cars. And also we want to thank Public Access Television for recording the talk. Those will be available on their Public Access channel. We'll get the schedule, and, and I will be sending that out to you. And then it will be available online, so you'll get the link. So if you know some people who might be interested in this topic, you can send, you know, send them the email and they can, uh, they'll be able to see the talk at a later date. And also, this place runs on volunteers, right? So if any of you have an interest in American <coughs> history, you meet interesting people like Rob and John Achenbach and Phyllis back there. Uh, we, it is a great place to meet visitors from all over the country and also from foreign countries who come here to learn about Vermont. The Vermont brand is a extreme interest and we're seeing a real uptick in tourists now that COVID is over with. So uh, if you would like to be involved in any way, stop by and you know, stick around and talk to us. And thank you for coming. The next talk will be August 16th. Jacob Barney, who uh, Rob, I'm sure you know, uh, has written a lot about the Vermonters' uh, activities in the War of 1812 will be our speaker on the 16th. All right, so again, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.